Well, anyway, should we jump into the Ableton Live stuff? I mean, 12 is almost you start here. This thing? <laughs> it's so crazy, man. I don't know about you, but when I first found out 12 was coming, I'm like, really? Already? Seems kind of soonish. But then I played with the private beta that we had as CTs, and I was like, there's a lot in here. There's so much yeah. stuff. And I had to relearn the MIDI clip. Mm -hmm. really i mean the whole thing is so different yeah after we had that meeting online i kind of like went upstairs and i was like oh my god <laughs> almost like i was excited but i was like i got a lot to learn and <laughs> there's so many new things to keep track of i was really excited and a little bit overwhelmed too <laughs> for sure it didn't even hit me until the day after i was like i'm gonna have to re-record all of my videos <laughs> Because the clip's so different, people are going to be confused. I'm going to yeah. have to re-record so much stuff. At the same time, I'm actually pretty excited about some of the new stuff, and we're definitely going to go through a lot of it. But I figured we could just go through um, like the three different categories. Feel free to share any random thoughts you have. We, this will be like super laid back. I think the upgrade to 12, like I've already had people ask me, is it worth upgrading? I have 11. I bought it a year and a half ago, so I don't get a free upgrade. I think Live 11 is awesome. Do you need 12? Probably not. But do you want 12? Absolutely. If you have any computer in the last 10 years, 15 years, or an iPhone, you've got plenty to make music. You've got more than the Beatles had. There's no new thing that is the magic ticket that's going to you know, get you to where you want to go. Yeah. Um, so you can definitely be fine without it like, like of course right like yeah that, that's the kind of illusion we are given like with all the new technology new phone comes out like a year after you got your phone you're like oh man the camera's a little better and like you feel like your phone's a piece of garbage now it's yeah. not it's still great and there's no thing that's gonna make you suddenly a successful musician or it just doesn't happen i've, I've thought it's gonna happen a lot of times in my life but by now i know <laughs> But it is, it's a, it's a great upgrade. I mean, I'm excited about it. Um, yeah. It depends what you want to do, I guess, and how into that stuff you are. Like some people really like to keep up with stuff. I know people that are still way back. My, my buddy just brought over his computer the other night, and he it was an old laptop from like 2016 that he just bought on eBay. Nice. And it's got Pro Tools 10 on it. And that's what he uses. And, and he always buys the old computer so he can just have the old software Mm. Um, in watching him do it, I was kind of like, ooh, this is, this is a little slow. This Sounds is like terrible. a lot of new stuff. <laughs> but he's still making his music. So. Yeah. Yeah. And if that's what he's used to and that's what he likes, like more power to him, you know? Yeah. Cause, so. cause kind of like what we just talked about in the beginning, like you got to learn the new stuff too. Yeah. So that, that's another consideration. But yeah, my excited, of course, I'm thrilled. This is. Live is my favorite computer program ever. So it, it gets a new thing. It's like Christmas. I mean, we've yeah. been really lucky the last like year, if you think about it, like Note came out then Push mm. 3 came out and now Live 12 is coming out. It's like a lot of cool things. Yeah, the Ableton team has been working hard these last two years for sure with all these new developments. Yeah, man. First of all, it's great having you on the podcast. Yeah, man. It's great to see you. You too, man, for sure. It's always a pleasure. Is this your third time or fourth time? I couldn't remember. I'd have to check. Uh, it might be four. It might be four. I don't know. This could be the number four, which would actually put you as the most attended guest on the podcast. Yes. Like, sound the air horn. <laughs> like, that's special. You should have a little celebration. I'm excited for the trophy to come into the mail. <laughs> Do you like matcha? I'll send you some magic mind. They just keep sending me ridiculous amounts. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, send it along. I'll try it. Do you like? Yeah, it's good stuff. If you like like green tea or matcha. I love it, yeah. It tastes like really delicious grass, but it helps you like with energy and focus and <laughs> relaxation and anti-anxiety. I, I love this stuff. Shout out Magic Mind. So I'll send you a box because you are the most returned guest and you deserve the best. So, Well, dude, I, I just want to say one thing I was thinking about today too. You know, we're both doing a podcast. It's music production related and we're both Ableton people, certified trainers and really deep into it. I think there could very well be, if there were a different set of characters in the world, it could be very competitive and like, oh, I don't want that guy on my thing. Like <laughs> it could be like, you know, opponents in this, but I love that it's a camaraderie. We're always in touch, chatting, keeping up. Yeah. And, uh, 
that's yeah, the cool man. thing, man. And I, I'm glad you're that way. I couldn't imagine thinking of this as like a competitive sport. That would just suck. That would suck, suck the life out of it. It wouldn't be fun at all. I don't know. No, I like got meeting, that guest. <laughs> and I've learned a lot from you. I've learned and a lot like from a you, lot man. of the resources that you put out. And that's one big reason I do this podcast. You just meet cool people like yourself and people who are smart like you who can teach me stuff to make me sound smarter than I am. It's great. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm doing the same trick, man. <laughs> Every time I speak to someone, it's like a great education. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, well, should we should we jump into these features? Yeah, I know man. people are here for it. They're going to want to know. To be honest with you, I've probably only just spent maybe like four to five hours in 12. I would have loved okay. to spend a lot more till now. I just haven't had tons of time. But I've touched on pretty much all. I've played with all the features we're going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about at least today. Should Let we start you, off? Yeah. Well, if you were the like marketing team from Ableton, what would you be billing as like the front and center feature? If I had to pick release? one feature? Yeah, you know, there's always like something. And I'm curious what you would say. That's really hard because it would depend who I'm talking to as from a marketing perspective. Like, because there's certain things I think that are valuable more for certain people. What if you're talking to yourself? I'd say the two things that probably are I'm going to use the most that are the game changers for me is number one, the new audio effect roar mm. and probably the performance pack, surprisingly, mm. which I spent a lot more time playing with last night. For anybody who performs live, the performance pack is a game changer for your workflows. I mean, I've had to piece together a lot of random Max for Live devices from different people over the years to make certain things happen. And I think this one pack is going to pretty much take over most of those, if not all of them, that I've ever mm -hmm. used. Yeah, for anybody performing live, performance packs, a game changer. We'll talk more details about that. But Roar is just mind-blowing. It's basically a multi-band uh, distortion and compression uh, audio effect that is unlike anything I've seen in live. And you can destroy sounds, and it still sounds good, with a bunch of different filter shaping options, all kinds of options with saturation effects and the modulation matrix. You can go deep with LFOs. You can destroy sounds, the bass designing dream as well, or drums yeah. or anything. Yeah. It almost feels wrong to call it like a distortion effect or a saturator. Because yeah. I mean, that's definitely one of the uses of it, it and it has right. that. And when I first opened it, I've thought a lot of the electron analog heat, which is a sick so. distortion box. It's okay. got a bunch of different distortions and modulations. It's got LFOs. It's got an uh, envelope follower, um, a filter in there. And it sounds great. It's such a cool Ooh. thing. Roar is sort of like that. And then it's got like the multi-band or multi-stage thing. And uh, really quickly becomes just a weird sound design effect. It does. I mean, you can, you can, like I said, absolutely destroy sounds with it. Should we share our screens for this so people can see what we're sure, talking yeah. about? I do have people, uh, if you're on my Spotify or if you're on YouTube, you should be able to see our screens because this will be video shared as well. But yeah, this is basically Roar. So you can open up this window and it's got, if you change it, uh, the routing to multiband, then you can enable these three different bands and you can play with the crossover as well. Or this, I'm sorry, that's the filter. But um, yeah, you can really play with a lot of different options in here. I mean, you've got different filter types. You've got different shapers, which they added some new ones in here. And then you can really just crank and shape the waveforms. Um, so you mm -hmm. can do a lot of really cool waveform distortion. Um, you can drive it here. You can compress. There's like a, the, a compressor on the output stage of the device. So you can really slam stuff. Um, you can also turn on the sidechain high pass filter, dry wet. Um, you can play with the feedback mode. So you can actually just like create some kind of really cool delay kind of feel or sustaining option here. That's a wild effect right there. The it's feedback. a wild effect. Yeah, it, it is. It, That's crazy. it creates like guitar distortion feedback. and It does. Lots, yeah. It gets out of control fast, which I love. I, I, I want I stuff too. to just get like wild. <laughs> 100%. Yeah, you have your modulation matrix over here. So you can also play with the LFOs independently or envelope or noise even. Yeah, so there's a lot in here too as well. So you can play with so much inside the matrix. 
in a perfect world, we would just have like five hours to go over everything in, <laughs> in great detail, but there's a lot to go through. So that being said, I personally would pay like a hundred dollars for Roar if if it was just a standalone plugin. I personally yeah. think it's worth a hundred dollars, if not more. I think it's my favorite distortion plugin yeah. that I can think of um, that I have anyway. Yeah, it's it's just like gonna be the thing for me. It's gonna be the thing. <laughs> People are gonna upgrade just for this. I'm calling it right now. Anyway, so that's Roar. What about you? If you if you had to pick like the one golden nugget from twelve, uh, what would you choose? Right, I might have said Roar. Um, really, it's funny I ask you that question. I don't have an answer myself, uh, <laughs> but probably all that MIDI stuff that's going on in the MIDI clip editor with the transformations, yeah. with the generators, um, and just slicing the MIDI notes into all of those. Um, you know, like so. One of the features is you can highlight any MIDI note and just slice it into a certain number of equal slices. So mm-hmm. you can make like really weird rhythms. So you can take like a quarter note and slice it into like seven, and get these yeah. kind of cool things happening. It's based on the grid too, and it's the same shortcut as Arrangement View, which is Command E if you're on Mac, which I like. So yeah. some of those shortcuts in Arrangement View are like in that clip now too, which is kind of cool. Right. Right. It, it makes sense, and um, yeah, I, I'm just finding myself making these strange beats that are just I would never be able to play, <laughs> and I wouldn't really be able to think of. Uh, like I can't count that. I can't count like ten hi hats in a one bar loop while I'm counting like yeah. six, uh, you know, like rim shots. Uh, but you yeah. can have it play, and, and you listen to it, and it's these weird grooves that just have like a new feel it's really fun i 100 percent agree it was overwhelming at first to try to figure out what everything was doing and stuff can get out of hand real quick with the generative tools um, but yeah. maybe let's start with the instruments and effects and we can just go through everything one by one you made a lot of videos actually of the things we're yeah. talking about so everybody check out brian funk's youtube channel it's pretty dope well thank you dan yeah yeah melt is sick um and it, it's a bi tambourine uh, I don't know, it's, it's something I've never even heard of, you know, some description of a synthesizer. Yeah, me but too. it's Just basically, up words. yeah, there's two sound generators. They're not even really oscillators. Some of the generators are oscillators, but there are other ones that are uh, like rain and bubbles and all these weird kind of abstract things. And you, each one of those sound sources has a filter, an envelope, an LFO, two LFOs. Yeah. Um, so they get kind of processed separately and brought together in a cool way. I don't know if you're going to hear it if I play it, but there's this one preset called Cracked Piano, which is just sick. But we've got, like, these are generators for sound. So you get your basic shapes, which are the oscillators we're all used to. Square, sine, triangle, you know, saw. But then we get into, like... Okay, so you got a sub generator. So there's just like a speaker for you. <laughs> it looks like yeah. a sub. Fold FM, which is really kind of cool, kind of like DX7. Chip sounds, so that's video game stuff. Shepherd's Pie, I, I got to play with that one. Bit Grunge, I don't even know what that is. It's nasty sounding. <laughs> it's yeah. like crackle is like great, like vinyl crackle type stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. Rain, bubble. Uh, they're yeah. weird, you know, there's just, they're interesting things to start with. And you put them through your envelopes, you got LFOs, but then you also got this one LFO FX here where you can take these LFOs and start like really mangling them a little bit. So now the oh, modulation cool. gets like, that. yeah, it's all, it does all this weird stuff. I mean, I'm just clicking on stuff without any real direction. Yeah. You just get like new kinds of shapes and movements to your sound. And there's also wow. just another LFO that LFO two that's kind of more standard. Um, and then you got your filters, and then there's some crazy filters in here. Yeah. A redux filter, which kind of destroys it, bit crushes it, vowels, comb plus and minus, plate resonator. I'm not even sure what that's supposed to mean, but it sounds <laughs> weird and interesting. Yeah. Um, filter is that even a word that? Like, I don't even know what that word means. Filth. It is now. Filth. I've never like heard of it. Dirt, I guess. Drive, because it's got this drive on it. It's like filthy dirt. 
Yeah. They're so fun to play with. And each layer, they're kind of laid out really nicely. Where Now I'm in the B generator. And um, it's got its own here. And then they kind of combine together. You can mix them, pan them out how you want. Oh, this is the pan. Um, yeah. I'm really happy that Ableton is sticking to these modulation matrix windows. Right, me too. I feel like it's so much easier to see. And Wavetable was like the first of that kind. Yeah. Um, where you really started to see this aesthetic, which I thought was really nice. That whole big matrix window. Click on it, it pops up. There's LFO rate one, and here's all the things I can modulate it with. Really easy. And there's two pages to it, one for A and one for B. What I really like about this synth is it's really fast to get weird. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That's true, man. And But it's at the same time, it can be really simple. There's not a lot going on in the basic interface. Yeah. You just have like two layers, layers of oscillators. You're shaping them and really, it kind of lives up to its name, meld. I mean, that's where the name came from. It's basically just melding two different layers of oscillators together. And you can start with interesting shapes of waveforms that haven't existed in in live it's pretty cool yeah it's a, just another cool synth i'm kind of surprised we got one because we just got drift right and drift is amazing it is i'm still you know appreciating all the little details in there yeah so. and it's mpe enabled which mm -hmm. a lot of these synths are now it also has scale awareness which we'll talk about in a little bit maybe we should hold off on that because that's its own thing granulator right. three have you played with that yet only once so i kind of took it out played with it was like well this is going to be fun and uh that was <laughs> yeah it. <laughs> it's a nice upgrade from granulator two and it has a really cool in and out section where you can record direct into the granulator instrument itself so you just hit the capture button and then the last few seconds that were recorded so if i'm i was playing this with my moog last night I was just playing a couple different notes and I hit the capture and without any delay or anything, it just instantly started playing back like a small granular part of my Moog. And that's cool. It sounded great. And then you can, it instantly just switches. So I could, I could just start playing MIDI after I record it as audio, if I have it connected as MIDI as well. Mm. So it'd be a re really cool way workflow just to record audio instantly and just start playing it back as MIDI, however you want to. Um, yeah, I love that. Really fun for live Immediate. performance stuff. Right. Yeah, I got to dig into it more. It has the three modes on the, the bottom left, that little window. Mm -hmm. And if you open that up, one of them is called cloud. It might be the default when you first open it. That might be a new um, mode, but it has like a really smooth sound. Because sometimes granular synthesis can sound a little like crunchy or you know what I mean? Or it's like not as smooth necessarily until you really dial it in. But the cloud playback mode makes it sound really smooth and like pad-like, which is kind of cool. Yeah, it's much more understandable. And yeah, yeah, it, it's cleaner. Yeah. So I, I could see myself using this as a live instrument just for fun, hmm. just playing back sounds and effects. Yeah, live sampling, like right into the samplers. Yeah, or just record somebody in the crowd with a mic. And then you could just instantly yeah. turn it into something, you know? Right. Good uh, stage presence. Keep things interesting, yeah. For Unique sure. for your shows. They also said that there's new modulation behavior. So on according to the site, it says modulation destinations are no longer taken over by the modulation source. So you can adjust the like a parameter being modulated even after assigning an LFO or something else to it. So it's like a modulation inception, basically. <laughs> yeah, I just did it on here real quick. Um, oh, okay. I just yeah. grabbed the random knob on granulator. It's this LFO frequency here. Um, and I'm using an LFO to modulate it. And you can see it's, it's moving, so it's showing me where my values are, and I can change the rate and all of that. But I can still move the knob, which is really cool because it used to be, and I think... Yeah, it still has that functionality. So if you click on this little mod button, it turns into remote. And now mm. I can't control it. And oh, okay. the way it used to be, if you wanted it to be within a certain range, you had to kind of like play with the depth and the offset. Yeah. It was more work. It's easier to dial it in now. If you could just it's more yeah. how you would expect it to work. That's a nice little update, but yeah, I feel like there's so many more possibilities now 
for like continuous real time control of parameters or just going deeper inside of each knob. Mm -hmm. So those are the new instruments and effects that I'm aware of outside of the performance pack, obviously. Right. Um, you want to talk about that a little? Um, I've barely, sure. I just kind of opened it and I I love the, there's one device. There's four devices. So I'd like the, maybe yeah, the you should take over the screen here. Oh, uh, sure. I can do that. Um, yeah. I spent a couple hours with it last night because I'm actually wanting to start performing more. You know, I performed for many years, but I kind of fell off the bandwagon. And now I'm getting back into it and just trying to rethink how I would maybe set up my new live setup. I think the performance pack is going to really help with a lot of that. So it's by IFTA. Probably the most powerful one that I would use is the performer. The performer, it's a control surface. So you can have it as like a floating window. Like you can open editor. looks like this. And you can just start adding and creating your own control surface. So if you go into this edit view, so I could just have a couple control knobs. And the cool thing is like previously, if you wanted to MIDI map stuff to your controller, you know, you could do that. Now you have access to map a ton of extra things in live that live wasn't natively doing on its own before. They claim you can control anything in live. So I am yet to test everything, but that was the claim on the website. So that's a pretty bold claim. If you nice. can, you can basically map and control anything in live with performer. Like I said, you can create these different, so you can have like a button control on and off. You can have different faders. Um, but then what you can do is you can go into this macro editor view and you have a lot of options as far as like, assigning and mapping this to pretty much whatever you want. So you could build a replica of your MIDI controller that you're playing with live if you wanted to and actually see everything here. And you can name these individual controls to whatever they're mapped to. So it's basically like a virtual mapping of whatever you want to map for a live performance inside of your project. So I could map this control to to my physical controller, or I can map this control to to you know, some other random macro knob on a certain track. And then you can create different presets as well, which is kind of fun. Uh, there's also, you can go deeper and there's eight outputs available per control. So you can see down here, you have all these different slots. And so you could actually send this to a MIDI output or you could send it to a CV source if you're using modular, which is kind of fun. Pretty wild stuff. I mean, it's... It's pretty cool. I mean, you can go in here and just click map. Then I can map this to whatever I want. Say if I go into this, I can just map this to this frequency knob. And now you can you can see that frequency knob is moving. Go into your MIDI map options, and I can map that to say my physical controller or something like that. And my controller is actually not plugged in right now. I thought it was. <laughs> but then I, I could move that knob, and it would actually move that mapping for me and then you can actually play with the curve value this is the cool part right here for me yeah um, yeah so you can really control like it's typically it was just a linear control of the knob right right you could change the minimum and the maximum but now you can make all kinds you may go up and down and back and forth <laughs> yeah you can you can make that knob basically move however you want you can lock it into the grid as well so you can snap it you can quantize it you can change the divisions for how that knob is being affected. I mean, you can do some crazy stuff. When you turn that knob, it's going to be bouncing around in that shape. So there's there's so many different things you could do. Um, mm. And this goes really deep. So we could probably spend a lot more time talking about this. Um, yeah, here's, that also one... your, your, here's your routing matrix as well for the output. There's um, probably a video course that needs to be made for this one. Yeah. Absolutely. But this is something I could see myself using. You know, if you had an external monitor or something on stage, you could just custom map everything and create multiple presets. And then you could just look at it and say, okay, you know, this is my setup. I can see all my knobs and the position that everything's in. If I want to do like a fade in, fade out between songs or, you know, certain effects hits, you can label it and customize mm -hmm. it however you want with your controllers in this, this uh, standalone window. So that's kind of fun. There's also variations. There's variations here. 
similar to ha like having variations if you were just to like say group this and you open up your uh, macro window then you have like your snapshots you can create different variations basically this is like a the same concept but in its own effect window you can store different snapshots of everything in live so if you hit a new button to create a new snapshot then you can <laughs> I, I found it was like helpful in like session view if i had like a couple different clips and those clips were playing whoop sorry it's super loud just scared myself <laughs> i don't know if you heard that <laughs> no i don't hear anything <laughs> okay cool I like that use and bounce in place, by the way. That's it's a great device. I know, but it's broken in 12, which really sucks. Oh, really? Yeah, so maybe that'll get fixed. I think beta. it will. Valium de people, I'm not sure how it's pronounced. Whoever that is, is really good at updating their stuff. I use um, the clip gain also. Yeah. There was just a new update sent out. Yeah. So there's a push three thing. It just came out. It's cool. Well, apparently they did update some Max for Live stuff and it's a little more open source now. So people programming mm -hmm. their own Max for Live devices have more options, I guess, as far as accessing Ableton's API. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of cool. So it'll be interesting to see what new devices and workflows can come out of Max for Live that weren't possible before. So yeah, the variation, basically, you can, you can link it specifically to clips or scenes. For example, if I have these two clips playing and I wanted to capture that snapshot, I could... And then if I wanted this other set of clips to be playing, I can create a new variation and create a snapshot of that. And then I could jump between these different variations and do basically like set changes on a clip level or a scene level. So you could even do that as deep into the track as with effects. So if I had a series of effects I wanted to be turned on or off, you can create a snapshot across different tracks as your whole project and have certain things triggering and turning on and off at different points in time whenever you want it. Mm. So rather than having to load this on every single track, it's really cool because like you can do it on different, like across different tracks as well, which is kind of fun. Right. So if I'm working on a track, I'm playing live, I'm turning a bunch of knobs and reverb filtering everything's getting real crazy too crazy yeah. i can click the variation that brings me right back in one button press exactly that's yeah. super cool there was one there was a device a while back uh plastic man i think made that was sort of similar to this this seems to have a lot more features um, it i does. forget what it's called i just remember plastic man uh <laughs> But it was like a capture of your of where every single knob and every single fader was in your set, and then you you capture that, and then you can capture another one, and you could just switch between them. So yes, that, I know what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. It seems oh, to be well, like this is the idea with you know yeah, some more customization. Exactly. And from what I understand, I think you have to set it to sixteen. Oh, that's the pre-arranger. Never mind. I'm thinking of a different device. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can set the global quantize. So when you hit those variations, it stays on tempo as things are playing. It just jumps to the next quantization that you have set globally. Mm -hmm. um, and you can choose to include clips or devices or sends or mixer controls individually. And then it has a recall or stash. So if you wanted to save like, you know, multiple presets, you can also go into the parameter section, which I haven't done a lot of, but it looks like you can exclude certain tracks. So if you didn't want one track to be a part of that variation, you can actually say, I don't want this track to be involved, which is really even more powerful because then you're not just tying it to the whole project. You know, you can exclude certain things and get really detailed with what you want to happen when you want it to happen. So this is kind of, this alone, I think is a massive game changer for live performance. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, these devices seem to really let you just get into the nitty gritty and really go deep. And the cool thing about this is it's it's a native live pack for 12. So it's going to be supported. So mm -hmm. if there's bug fixes and stuff, I'm assuming they're going to be taking care of that. It'll be fixed, which is yeah. great, obviously, because when you're performing live, last thing you want to happen is a crash. <laughs> and then you're just yeah. awkwardly standing My life in front of everybody. Is all ableton devices it's not yeah third-party plugins because that's where that's where funny things happen yeah <laughs> stability nightmares ain't nobody got time for that so that's variations we could definitely go deeper into that but the other thing that i thought was cool was that i probably won't use <laughs> is uh the pre-arranger so basically pre-arranger the idea is that if you hit this button to create a track 
it'll pop out at two tracks. One is the MIDI track that determines how long you want to record and when it starts playing back. And then the other one is to do the actual recording on. So you can rename these if you wanted to. But once again, the concept is basically it's made for arrangement view, but it'll start arranging your recording. So if you just want to start recording really fast, you could say, okay, I want this four bars of recording this guitar. Or when you just even hit play, you don't even have to hit record. See, it's actually recording right now. Mm -hmm. See how it just spit out that new track? So it gives you this is like your time to record in, and then it starts recording here. And then um, you can duplicate this for however much longer you want to record. I might be yeah. doing this backwards, but that's the concept. And then you can actually make it so it'll just create new tracks and you can just keep going and layering on top of layering, spitting out new tracks and recording more. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's kind of, to me, it's like, that's cool, but you've already got comping. You have comping that basically can do a lot of this for you already, but it's just visualizing it on multiple tracks. Kind of the yeah, it's another here, option from for looping and doing stuff on the fly. So, yeah, it's it's cool. So it does have the arrangement looper, which is made more for looping. Um, the arrangement looper I thought was kind of cool for people who perform in arrangement view, um, or even just recording ideas in arrangement view. Also, I want to point out that I was search; it was already there, and I just typed in arrangement, and then. I couldn't find it right away. So a nice update with the browser is you can actually go back. So if you're searching something, you can go back through all of your history of your searches in your browser, which is nice. So I'll just hit the back arrow and then I should be able to find Yeah, there it is. Mm. So I just hit back twice and I'm just where I was in the browser, which is nice. So this is arrangement looper. Basically, you can set the length of the bars for the loop bracket. So this isn't, this isn't actually recording or storing audio in the device itself. It's just moving around the loop bracket for recording purposes. And so you can just keep recording or instantly playing back whatever you are playing live. So, or if you have a section that you just want to keep jamming on, you can just keep looping and this loop bracket will jump around wherever you want it to. So that's the concept of it. So if you if I have my playhead right here and I hit two bars, it just automatically snapped it two bars long where I was at on the grid. So that's basically mm -hmm. what it is. So that could be really useful, you know, if you want to play live in arrangement view and loop around. Right. So I guess you would map those big circle buttons to maybe like a foot pedal even. And yep. Just, that's nice. It has four presets you can play with. Pretty basic, nothing too fancy there, but could be useful. So that's a performance pack. I mean, there's we could spend more time on it, but there's a lot of other features in here that are really cool. There's a lost and found pack as well, which I don't think we have access to yet. Can't find it. <laughs> it's called, it does say, a collection of sounds fashioned from unusual materials, percussive trinkets, unique Foley recordings, and expressive objects to infuse your productions with character and authenticity. Dig deep and create layers of decorative, expressive instruments, playful drum racks, and rich sound effects. So whatever that means, that's coming. So Yeah, the, the uh, examples sound really cool. It sounds like a lot of found objects used to make percussion. I love that kind of stuff. Yeah. Some guy with a mic in Berlin just like walking through a junkyard, just yeah. like finding stuff. Um, should we go into workflows? Just like general workflows? Absolutely. I have that email I sent you. I don't know if we want to go yep. through these together. Well, like freeze and flatten is just one thing, right? That's cool. So just yeah. right click, freeze and flatten. It's basically bounce in place. You know, like what right. you have in a lot of other DAWs. Now, you got this one... Um, keep monitoring latency in record on tracks and, and i was looking at that myself um yeah I, I dude that is can i take over for you please uh, the do. screen for a second yeah let me um, stop sharing because Go I, I got it all i was that was the last thing i was doing before we uh got in touch oh i, I think this it. alone for people who play live instruments or just anything live this is a game changer for recording yeah because there was always that problem Oh, where yeah. when you record something, it didn't go where you kind of thought it would go. Mm -hmm. So there's this new button here, keep latency. And the way I just tested it, I had these two audio tracks recording my mic. And I just said the same nonsense into a mic. And then when I zoom in here, you can see the difference in the timing where, where I said, don't keep the latency. I turned it off. This happens earlier 
than here. So I'm imagining what's happening is, and I also put on like a, a Waves tune, some plugin that I knew that had a lot of latency. Yeah. So we could really see it. Um, they both have that on. And you can see the first one is much earlier, which is probably where I intended the sound to happen. And this is what would happen in the past is that it would actually put it a little bit late. Yeah. And we're not talking a ton of time where it's like a tenth of a second, not even a tenth. It's like a... Yeah, it's just enough to be annoying. It's enough where, yeah, it could be a little weird. Yeah. Um, and they have it for MIDI as well. But it's so something I didn't understand. Maybe you understand. Um, if you read the info view, when you hover over these things, it tells you, you kind of want to have this on for audio recording, which makes sense want my yeah. audio to be where I intended it to be. But it says you want it off for MIDI. And I kind of didn't understand why, because I did a little test recording again here with these two tracks were armed and I played the same MIDI notes. Yeah, it says um, it's recommended to keep monitoring latency in recording on when using software instruments or effects and to switch it off when recording acoustic instruments or relying on external monitoring. It must be something going on under the hood where it's able to compensate on its own. And this button is really just more for like recording audio into your interface. That's yeah. kind of my guess. And so like there's something maybe behind the scenes happening. Your MIDI latency and then your audio latency is going to be a little different depending on your sound card, right? For your audio interface and how you're recording into audio. So maybe mm. they kind of separated it for that purpose. Yeah. Okay. That's my we're, guess. We're talking like, this is what, like hundredth of a second difference, but you know. I mean, I was running a heavy project yesterday and I did the same thing where I had like four instances of Trillion, which is basically Omnisphere. Mm -hmm. And I had uh, like five arcades running by output, which is a CPU hog. And I was recording audio without any notable latency on my Moog. And it was like, I've never had that before. But my buffer was 512, which was kind of crazy. I didn't have any noticeable latency. And that's when I turned off the keep latency, I believe, for audio like it recommended, right? Yeah, it recommends to have it off. And it makes sense based on where it's placing it. I, I can't imagine it could ever place it before you do it. So <laughs> that's where it's supposed to be. Yeah. I mean, that's been the long tail of like, why is there so much latency, blah, blah, blah. And then you have to teach yeah. students like, okay, you might want to do direct monitoring through your interface. And now that's not even a thing. You can just monitor inside of live in the track and pretty good from what I tested. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of those little things that um, are, you know, this isn't going to get a lot of attention. This isn't going to be like the first thing they show you. Uh, but it's something I came across. I was like, that's cool. I mean, yeah, another example really cool. of one of those little things is you can zoom in on these waveforms now with this little guy. Love Instead that. Of, so I'm not changing the gain. I'm just zooming in on the waveform. Right. That's and, something that uh, other DOS have had that people have been asking for for a while, actually. Yeah, because in the past, I would have to go in here and turn up the gain to like, if it was a really quiet signal, I'm trying to figure yeah. stuff out. So yeah. it's nice that that's an option nowadays. You can see the waveform. And you can just turn it off too. And that's MIDI mappable too. So I'll probably put that to like a computer keyboard. Oh, smart. Shortcut. Yeah, you key so map can that. just do that. Yeah. That's a great idea. So there's, they, I think they called it like stacked detail views. Basically, mm -hmm. you can see the clip view and device view at the same time now, as Brian is showing. And that's beautiful. And not only that, but the mixer controls on top as well. So you can, oh, you yeah. can stack the mixer controls and arrangement view. Yeah. So both views, really. I got like too much going on to see anything, I think. There yeah, that's a lot so of that, stuff. That was the uh, expanded meld. So, so yeah, many windows. Everything. <laughs> yeah, you need like a computer monitor now that's like six feet tall, so you can just like stack yeah. everything you want. Right, but I'm that's zoomed nice. In a little, I think, as well. I'm also not using the entire vertical um, space. Also, I don't know if this is a bug, and maybe you know, a complete off topic. But in arrangement view, I have a really hard time hiding my return tracks, and I don't know where to do that. And even in the okay, bottom... Okay, I just found this out like an hour ago. Um, okay. And under view, we have mixer controls, and that's all this stuff over here. 
uh, but now we have a range track control. So if I need to hide like the ins and outs, it used to be, you know, option command I, I think. And yeah, um, yeah. Or option was, command I is your in and outs. It would have been R, I believe. Yeah, like those aren't working the same way You'd, for yeah. the returns. Yeah. Which I kind of um, wish it did. It always volume. has. So that you have to go into this menu as far as I know. So here yeah. we go. Mixer controls, arrangement controls. So your return tracks. Wait, you you have there's no no. Is that the only way? I don't know. I haven't Yeah, I'm so confused why. So all of those old things you had, uh, you had a fun um, acronym for it, uh, it like a oh, bro slam. Yeah, yeah, right. So like all yeah. that stuff, um, all the ones that pertain to the mixer, though, seem like they're only happening on the the mixer, not on the arrangement version of the mixer. Right. So yeah, I guess either there's a shortcut we don't know about yet you know because that would be a conflict right how would we yeah yeah i thought that was really strange with viewing your return tracks and arrangement view i think there's something that needs to be done there because it was actually Mm -hmm. showing up and i don't know what just happened but i guess you're right i think that is the you have to go into the actual view yeah that's what i found so weird Weird. Yeah, I, I haven't gone through all these menus super carefully yet, but I did just discover that. Yeah. But yeah, you anyway. see it here, the ins and outs, the sends, yeah. the returns are here. I wish they would have kept the bro slim command option, B-R-O-S-L-I-M. That would have been nice. Uh, they did. Um, they did for the most part, except for that. The ones for the mixer only apply to the vertical mixers not mm. the horizontal ones in arrangement okay there Weird. might be something we don't know yet yeah it's very possible and some of That's this one might thing change. about like obviously the beta we're using right. and yeah. and the, all the documentation isn't finished yet so right. we don't have all of that so there's a lot of discovery True. that happens you, know, you click yeah. on things and try and stuff out yeah figure out how things work well ableton if you're listening Let's uh, maybe streamline some of those return tracks. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so mixer improvements. It says Live's mixer comes with visual improvements that make it more accurate for detailed mixing decisions. I haven't personally noticed anything. Have you? Uh, a little bit. It's um, It seems like I think these numbers are always there. They used to go away. Oh, okay. Um, and if you... Uh, you can see like more coloring in these faders here. Okay. Slightly different. It's very minor though. It's yeah, I, I didn't small notice stuff. much difference there. Should we talk about the browser? Because that's a big one. Yes. That one I'm still trying to get used to. There's some I'm really cool to... stuff and there's stuff I'm scratching my head about that I'm <laughs> yeah. trying to figure out and understand. The browser, I love it. I love the fact that now there's a little edit tab um, at the top where you can click on and then it opens up um, tagging and filtered searches. So we I'm had collection. Over to you. <laughs> oh, okay. Cool. There's a few things that I'm I'm like trying to learn how to navigate right now. With yeah, the, it was uh, weird at first. It took me a hot second and then I was like, ah, oh, dope, makes sense. But mm-hmm. basically, you have like your normal browser looks over here. You had your collections, right? And you can organize your, like, your collections by colors. Well, now you can go like way deeper. And if you select anything, so like my drums folder here, um, you've got all these tags or groups of tags that you can add. So this is a drums folder, so I can go into my drums and I can tag this however I want. I can create a new tag um, and... Uh, you know, I just maybe I'll call it drum folder and then I can select that. Hmm. Yeah, maybe, maybe it is. Yeah, it is because it's a folder. That's interesting. Okay. So you can't actually can't tag folder. folders. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can only tag individual things, but I think you can filter folders. So you could search for certain folders playing with this filter option. So this, you can filter content. That's cool. And it's automatic, actually. You don't even have to do anything there. You can just filter by device, presets, samples, or a, a set, which is kind of cool. So mm. 
you don't even have to do that. It automatically pulls it for you, which is kind of cool, or a function as an instrument. So if I go to my user library, that could be really valuable. If I'm in my user library and I just want to search for only presets or mm -hmm. only instruments or an audio effect or MIDI effect that's just in my user library, that's pretty gold. And then, yeah, if it's not a folder, it looks like you can go deeper as far as the type. And I guess that makes sense too, you know? Mm. Yeah, you can create your own groups and your own tags. So it says click add tag, add group to add a new tag either as a sub tag in one of the ex existing groups or as a new tag group, which can have its own sub tags. Okay, so interesting. So you can create a new group and then create your own tags in that group, it looks like. Yeah, it looks basically the collections were a great upgrade. They're they're fun. Uh, but yeah. now I guess you can really do your a lot more with customizing how you get around. Yeah, I'll tell you exactly. the thing I really like. Coolest part of the browser to me right now is the similar sounds. Yeah, yeah, I did this the other day and it was it worked surprisingly well. Yeah. Um, if I go into let's say like my samples or user library, I just type in kick, and if you right click on that sample, then I can choose show similar files, and then it just shows all the similar files. And I think that's just for my user library, or is that including core library and everything else packs. It might depend where you are. I don't know actually though. Um, it seems like it gets a lot of stuff and, and fast. There's a lot of stuff. So maybe it is everything. Yeah. I don't know. Or it's, it might just be whatever tab is over here on the left, my user library, which I'm guessing that's what it is. Cause I got a lot of stuff, but mm -hmm. anyway, you can, this is just going to basically take like the timbre and tonality and read the waveform. And then it'll suggest and filter all of the kicks that sound similar to that one kick that I wanted right. the similarity of. So yeah, like you can find, like if you like it, if it's close, you know, but it's not yeah. quite there, you do the similar sounds, you can find it. I think you yeah. could probably even, if you have a song, right? Like maybe you got like mm. a track that you'd love the drums in, sample it. Yeah. Put that in that, there. That's a good idea. It's a good and idea. And see if you have other samples that are close to it, so you're not lifting the actual sample. Wow, uh, that might that's be a, a cool uh, idea. Yeah, right. Yeah, so like kind of get away with it because <laughs> you're not sampling it anymore. So I clicked "Show Similar Files to a, a, like a Wave Stereo Track," and it's giving me like kicks and hi hats and stuff. So, well, I'm wondering if let's say. Like I love the snare drum in a song and I, I find a spot where it's isolated, but I don't want to just sample the snare from that song. I can record that sample, name it like whatever, and then do hmm. find similar, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's my thought. But it also, so I'm hovering over cool. this master and it says similarity search is deactivated for this file. The file might be too long, broken, or not accessible. So mm -hmm. I think it has to be like a short sample. Like, I don't think it can be something probably more than an ideal like one shot or a, a short loop. Most mm -hmm. likely, I think is what it's made for. Yeah. But I would take like, say you have a cool snare that I want to copy, right? But I don't want to steal it. <laughs> I might true. just take your song and highlight that snare Command J, you know, into yeah. a new clip, and then find me something that sounds like that. That's a really good idea. <laughs> that's that's uh, one way to do it for sure. And that that little um, control also works on the drum racks and in Simpler too. So exactly. you can you can basically have your whole like drum rack, and you just want similar sounding kits, and just cycle through them. Totally, um, I love that because sometimes you're searching through your samples, and you're like, yeah, it's cool, but it's it's what else do I got? <laughs> yeah where where is that in the drum rack i was trying to find that the other day it's um right next to the uh hot swap button on the so top he... on the title bar oh here it is okay yeah. so is it based off of whatever selected and being visible no, no. In the sampler? click on it you'll see um oh, notice how everything is. changes so you yeah. can switch individual kits or there's now a left right arrow right next to the similar sounds button on the title bar and you and it'll switch everything and if you click the lock buttons on those drum cells it won't change that so you're like That's hey i like so my cool. crash party sound that you got there and 
it'll stay there, but everything else changes. You can just get all yeah. kinds of crazy new stuff. Wow. Yeah, that's really powerful for the drum rack too. You can just swap and out it's all similar of your sounds. sounds too, which is really nice. So maybe you like the clap, but you just want a little different. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. And you can just keep cycling through. It's almost like that whole 128s concept, except yeah. everything at once. Um, we talked about the browser history already, that you can go backwards and forward and just keep searching through your history, which is really nice. Let's see. It says, control core workflows in 12 using assistive technologies like screen readers and mm -hmm. new keyboard shortcuts to navigate to nearly every part of live. So that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, that's Any really good for that? accessibility. Um, yeah, I think it's there's just more keyboard shortcuts too. Um, and I there think are. it's like option one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Like it'll highlight different parts. It'll go from like your browser to your mixer to your devices. So if you want to navigate really well, you see how it's like selecting everything. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Also new themes. We love new themes because why not mix it up, you know? That preferences has also been shaken up a bit. I kind of like the immaterial one. It's like dark mode, but like cooler. Yeah, it's kind of neon. Yeah. <laughs> There's the angst robot. Honestly, that feels like I would have an epileptic seizure. Like that's it's really it, bright. It's got like an uh, early or like late 90s GeoCities website. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> It does. You got the classics, obviously. Classic, medium, dark. This yeah, has yeah. kind of always been my go-to. Anyway, so that's fun. Should we talk about the MIDI stuff, MIDI scale stuff? Do you want to share? Yeah, all right. Uh, this is fun and complicated. and Maybe explain uh, like the, the main new tabs that they have first. Yeah, Because okay. it does look super different. Actually, I'm going to pee. I'll be right back. Okay. If you don't cool. mind. <laughs> no, not at all. This episode is sponsored by Magic Mind. Honestly, I am obsessed with this stuff. I take it in the morning. I take it before a workout. I take it before I do a podcast now. It gives you all the mental clarity and focus you need without the anxiety of chugging coffee or any other energy products out there that are bad for you. You might be wondering, Dan, why would I need to spend my good hard-earned money on an energy drink? Well, it's not just like all the other crap out there. It contains 130 times the antioxidants of regular green tea. I actually gave a giant box of it to KMG Studios, where I'm doing in-person podcasts now, and the box didn't last long. A lot of the artists, a lot of the engineers love it there. One little shot gives you a perfect combo of nootropics, adaptogens, functional mushrooms, and includes ceremonial grade matcha, as they call it. It also can decrease inflammation, supports a healthy immune system. You can take it alongside your coffee or your tea if you're a coffee addict like myself without giving you that extra jitter or making you feel anxious throughout the day. I can think more clearly. I can be a lot more productive whenever I take this little energy shot. Magic Mind is backed by over 240 scientific studies designed to boost energy, enhance focus, and create a sense of calmness and alertness. And it probably will be the best part of your morning ritual or any other moments where you need that extra boost of focus and memory and energy. Definitely check it out. I don't think you'll be disappointed. It actually tastes good too. Just go to magicmind.com slash Ableton. Use the discount code Ableton20 in all caps. That's Ableton20 and save 20%. Highly recommend this stuff. I'll be taking it all the time. And yeah, I definitely recommend for you as well. Go to magicmind.com slash Ableton. Check out the link in the show notes for more details. Also, before I forget, I just thought of it. Uh, if you want some Magic Mind, just text me your address. I'll make sure I send it to you. Okay, cool. Yeah. Magic Mind sounds good. How magical? <laughs> uh, it's not that magical, like you okay. might think. I mean, I know I live in Denver. They manufacture it in LA, so it's a good right. question. But it is legal to take on a plane, so it's... All right, <laughs> All right cool. Uh, MIDI stuff here. I love this ability to chop notes. So you've got chop notes to grid command E, which is cool. You can join mm -hmm. them back together with the command J, like we said. Um, you can do this, hold command E, and then 
what I, let's see, it would be, I'm sorry, I'm going to join them back together. If I hold Alt and press E, I get this weird little new thing here where I can click and drag and make equal segments. That's so crazy. I get 10 notes here in a bar, which is pretty crazy. I can then go here, do it again, and maybe make a little like kind of a triplet sort of thing there. Yeah. Um, and then if you just hold down E, which you got to turn off your MIDI keyboard to do, but then you can just slice anywhere, which is pretty nice. Uh, awesome. It's so good for just little weird rhythms. Um, yeah. We've got, there's a human eyes control over here now. Um, That's big. That's a big one for sure. Yeah. yeah. So just kind of move, whatever you select gets humanized. Yeah. And there's, you can control how much humanization happens. Yeah, it's real time too. So you see it, you you watch it, you just get exactly what you want, which is so yeah. nice. I mean, so much music, especially electronic music, is like overly programmed to the grid. And I feel mm -hmm. like this makes it quick and easy to just throw stuff just slightly off the grid, make it feel yeah. a little less robotic. Yeah, it's great. You can reverse the notes nice and easy, um, add intervals. So if I just do that so i can build chords this way um mm. invert that stuff which nothing will happen now but um stretch the notes nice and easy yeah that's pretty weird let's play with that um, i'm going into some of these other guys here these uh generate these, no this would be uh transforms uh like yep. time warp is so cool so i've got all those notes selected and then i can change Basically, I'm like stretching it, like kind of like warping. So like the transformation tools and the generative tools are, I think, like the two biggest updates to ever happen to the clip. And, and you're the MIDI in the stuff is just wildly powerful now. Um, yeah. Quantize, too, is really awesome because it's real time now. You can, mm -hmm. instead of having to select your notes, like I always love to quantize to like a percentage less than 100. So I get that human feel, right? So if I play something, I still kind of maintain my playing, but I also clean it up a little. But yeah. you would always have to select it, choose a percentage and then apply it and then decide if it was right. If it wasn't, you have to undo it. But yeah. you can just have stuff playing and you can just dial in the amount of quantization you want until you got it just right. Um, it's also really cool. They added the same quantization feature in the audio clip as well, which is really wild. Is it? It's, I haven't even looked at that. That's cool. So yeah. if I had a sample, it's the same same knob? It's close to the same. That's great. So yeah, you can lock in. And what it does is it just automatically makes warp markers on the transients and pulls them into the grid. And these generators is like one that makes chords. <laughs> Yeah. So you get all these weird chords. Um, but then you go back to your transformations here and you got the strum one, which I love. The strum is a big one because a lot of people playing chords, them. you don't want yeah. every single note to hit exactly the same time. It's really right. Kind of really like nice. playing a guitar. You want them to happen brung, instead of just jink. <laughs> As a guitar player, I feel like you appreciate that. I love it. Yeah, it's so nice. Also, by the way, the chord device has that. The MIDI device has the strum mm. built in, which is great. Yeah, it does. I love the chord device now. Yes. I mean, there's just so many of these, and it just makes coming up with ideas a lot of fun because yeah. you, you get stuff you wouldn't do normally. Yeah. So it makes the whole... Um, clicking in MIDI notes into a clip like this, into the piano roll, it makes it so much more fun. I used mm -hmm. to hate doing it, but now I'm like, this is great. <laughs> yeah, you just start That's dragging so faders and changing values and you just get all these random new MIDI notes that are created in the clip, which is really cool. Um, yeah. So that's the transformation tools. There's, some, there's more in here I haven't even played with. A velocity shaper. There's some good ones with the velocity too. If you select like all these notes here, um, you've got the ramp right here. So you can just ramp them up, make those like crescendos or decrescendos. And then there's even a deviation. So it gives you some of the, yeah, you know, it's not perfectly computerized. Yeah. You randomize velocities real easy. Yeah, exactly. 
it's kind of going back to that whole like humanization element to the MIDI clip now. Yeah. Yeah, there's so much more life to it. I mean, mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be this kind of sterile thing. Yeah. As some some movement, some give. <laughs> yeah, I need to spend a lot more time in here into the transformation and the generative tab. Those alone, just there's so much you could do with them. Going to make it a lot more fun to compose when you don't have a controller with you. All For that. sure. So you, you could do scales in your MIDI clips in Live 10, uh, 11, but right. um, now it's kind of more integrated into the whole experience. So you've got this display at the top that shows you whatever the scale is of whatever clip you have selected. So if I, I can change it on this clip, this will be in Locrian now, and this other one is in Major. If I select them both, you'll see it does that little star that indicates there's more than one selected. Mm -hmm. um, within your clip, you can see the scales. Uh, they're purple keys now, so I can tell which notes are in my scale and which are not. And there's this little button here that will highlight the whole entire clip purple. So you can easy, you know, it's easy to see where these notes are supposed to go. You can fold that down so you only get your in scale notes. Um, I probably clicked around here before and there might be stuff that's not in the scale. So if I click fit the scale. Yeah, that's a nice know, feature. Yeah. yeah. So you can just put like chaos in here and then just do fit the scale and see what you get. Yeah, just locks it in for you. I mean, I know there's been times where I've like played a bass note and then later I listened to it, I was like, that doesn't feel right. And I realized the note was accidentally on the wrong place. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like half a step below. You could just, you know, hit that and that'll never happen again. At least it'll be in key. Yeah, it's really nice. Um, so where it gets interesting, I think, is when you start looking at like your MIDI tools like your mm -hmm. arpeggiator, which looks yeah. a lot nicer now, some good it visualizations. Does. That little scale awareness button here, so it recognizes whatever scale my MIDI clip is in. This is cool because if you have, say, your arp set to like a distance of one, one step, the distance control, the transpose distance, and then the steps, instead of just going through chromatically of the notes like it used to, now it'll go in the key. It'll stay in. It makes some makes for some really interesting melodic patterns that again like you probably wouldn't write yeah exactly um, i do like the interface of this a lot better than the previous that visualization is nice to yeah. see what what all what does converge and diverge really mean and then it shows you mm -hmm. you can repeat the uh, pattern as well however many times up to 16. yeah chord is great because when that's scale aware, you just kind of turn these shift controls to whatever you want and it'll always be in key. And then if you play a different note, like it might sound nice when you, the way chord always work, you could press like a C and have it so it makes like a C major chord. But then if you go to D and you want to stay in C major, it would play a D major for you because it would keep the intervals the same. Yeah. Do this like parallel motion, I think that's called maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Now, if I have it set to make me a C major and then I play a D, it'll be a D minor and it'll be an E minor, then an F major, it'll stay in key. But really nice. what's fun is to just set up a bunch of these and just play the different notes. And then instead of having them all be like blocky, you've got strum now, which will have them have this nice fluid sound. Mm -hmm. uh, you've also got probability or chance for each one of these notes to play. So you can sometimes not get all the notes playing on the chord. And then there's learn, which do I have it set up here. I don't have it set up. Yeah, if you choose the, at the top of the window, you can set the project uh, scale awareness, scale that you want to play on, should follow. I think I need to have a MIDI controller set up to do this, but you just play in notes and it learns those notes and it shifts everything. And then you can yeah, that's so crazy. move those around. Yeah. Oh, it's so much. I never used Chord. I never had any, I didn't think it was a very useful device until now it's. Yeah, me too. I love it. Same. Yeah, same goes. There's a scale awareness uh, in the pitch device as well. Yeah, pitch has it, random has it. Random yeah, is right. great because you can get random notes that are actually in tune. Mm hmm. 
without having yeah. to put the scale one after it. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. The scale device also uh, got a little upgrade too, didn't it? Yeah, it's a little prettier. Yeah. Got some more information. I, and you can actually pick your scale on it. You used to have to select a preset mm. to get all this stuff. So yeah. it's right there for you. Yeah. And even Meld has that too. It has scale awareness. So some of these generators will follow the notes. Yeah, um, I mean, that's Even the some thing. of the filters. I mean, that's the thing too. Like as far as, you know, if you're doing some weird pitch modulation or whatever else, mm. turning on scale awareness should move it closer to the semitone that's going to keep it in key, which is wild to think about when you're doing sound design. That's pretty, yeah. that's a nice hack. Yeah, it's it's really nice, and it's I think it's put in here in a way that makes a lot of sense. Um, at first, I thought this was at the top would be kind of the global, but it's not. It's whichever uh, clips you have, but by doing it this way, it kind of just works how you expect it to. So if you have another clip, like say like your next part of your song is in a different key or different mm. scale, um, it just switches to that. That's awesome. I didn't even to... realize that. That's amazing. Yeah. I like that the way they work this in there. That's really cool. There's a lot of stuff in here, man. They also added Max for Live MIDI tools now, which they say like opens up a world for more experimentation and you can access the MIDI transformations and generators inside the clip now for creating your own Max for Live tools. So within the piano mm. role, you can kind of hack it in a way to make your own devices which is kind of kind of awesome actually yeah there's one in here euclidean which i don't really understand yet i'll be honest i'm not really sure what's happening when i do this but maybe if i just give you a different clip so you can just kind of see um yeah i didn't fully understand that either it's almost like the circle of fifths kind of thing happening i don't know but it's giving me these chromatic notes like it's giving me C, C sharp, D, D. Like, that's not going to sound good. No. And it's also not in the scale. <laughs> um, yeah. Weird. I, I probably just don't know what I'm doing with it. Yeah. Like I said, man, there's. I need to spend a lot more time just playing with the generative tools to really fully understand them. There's a lot in there. Transformation tools is instantly a game changer just for stuff you've already played out and recorded just to humanize it and spice it up. Generative yeah. tools, like, it's just a bunch of happy accidents in my mind. What else? Anything else related to the MIDI clip that we haven't touched on that you think are really important? Uh, maybe just the tunings is a whole other thing. Scalophiles, is that how you pronounce it? I think so. These are things I need to start learning about now, too. So but, for anybody uh, who doesn't know what... Do you want to explain <laughs> what scalophiles are, or I can? Then why don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so what I understand from my limited understanding is basically, I mean, obviously in the Western scale, you got 12 notes outside of that. There's like a lot of places, especially like in the Middle East that have like their own tuning scale, right? So there's like, there could be like hundreds of different notes within a scale. Um, and now you can actually import what's called scale files and live already comes with some that you can import into your project to open up a whole new world inside of the piano roll to actually write and record new notes that were never possible, like in typical mm -hmm. Western music, which is really cool. I saw a video of, uh, it was uh, Ableton posted it. I think he was in India um, and yeah. he was a producer and he was like really stoked because now he can use live to produce a lot of stuff in a scale that we aren't typically used to uh, over here in the States, which is awesome. Yeah, I've got one selected, and I really don't know what all this means yet. But um, if you look at the piano roll, you can see like this note. It's not piano keys anymore. So no, you sort of have to v ignore what your piano keys are, <laughs> and just like realize like you're gonna play like your C, and then when you go to say like C sharp, it might be somewhere in between C and C sharp, mm -hmm. and then D might be. So after C sharp, but not quite D. And you can see it in these readouts on these MIDI notes. This is like greater than A, less than B flat, B flat, A sharp, greater than, or, you know, you know like, so, um, yeah, it, you can get some cool exotic stuff happening. It's really cool too. So it has its own tuning section where the groove pool is. 
yeah. uh, under the browser where you can actually change the reference pitch and the degree of the scale. So, and I think with this, you can start doing things like, you know, 432, people like that. Yeah. Um, and can then change the, the pitch frequency as well. Cause normally we're used to like 440 or whatever, but now right. it's, now it's all kinds of stuff and you can change it. Yeah. So it changes these notes. If you're DJing in key, I feel like that could be a little tough. If you're just going for like a like a scale of mixing, right? Yeah, this is another one of those things that'll just help you access different moods, different feelings yeah. in your music. Yeah, and it's, it's I mean, especially cool. if you're trying to create in some kind of genre and that style that uses these types of scales. Like you said, like a lot of Middle Eastern music. Man, this is so wild. I mean, I, we could just keep going. I feel like there's even more in here that we haven't <laughs> even touched on yet. Uh, one little thing that I've found that is cool is there's Round Robin in Sampler now. Round oh, Robin really? sampling. Yeah, so the way it works, you just click this little RR and um, any notes that you would have that's any samples that are set to play on the same note so that would be i guess like like these samples right here i don't know how i'm gonna show you this without actually hearing it but let's see so does it just scroll through the chains no it's not like you have the chain is what it is the velocity is what it is anytime you turn if i have round robin off all of these samples play every time i play a key you know, they're all playing. Yeah. Uh, probably all these crazy MIDI effects I just dumped on this track isn't helping. You see, every time I hit this key, this sample's always playing. As right. I turn this on, it didn't play until about five times. So it's cycling through these samples now. Oh, cool. So, so I it just goes through the From sounds. what I can tell, if it's if you have samples that would play simultaneously it will now cycle through those samples and you can have it go forward, backwards. It'll just play one of the other samples or it'll be completely random, which means you might get the same one twice in a row. And you can also have that, that um, sequence reset at certain musical intervals. So if you want like one sample to always be playing at the beginning of the bar or every four bars, you can have that yeah. happen too. That's a really cool idea. I did like a workshop on taking a bunch of bass sounds and like scrolling through playing them in and out so you can hear yeah. them kind of chopped up for certain genres is really popular. Mm -hmm. And uh, this could basically do that like even faster than what I was doing before. Yeah, I used to select them all. Yep, me too. I would distribute these. Yeah. And then I would go into like an LFO and modulate the chains, the sample selector. Yeah. With like a noise waveform. Oh, nice. <laughs> it, so it's just basically I have it set up. So now this thing is just randomly zipping around. So it'll play yeah. any sample. Um, but that's a lot more work than just doing this. That's pretty cool. <laughs> and it frees up your sample selector too for other things. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's a good pro tip. Yeah, that's one I didn't really... I saw it like in a forum, on I think our Dang. trainer forum or something. But uh, So much in here. Lots of little things in here that I think we're not noticing too. <laughs> Do like two more of these to actually catch up with all the features in 12. But that, I think and we that's one thing I'm ones. liking is that you're not, you're not going to use this and be lost either. It's still familiar. So some of these funny little changes that we're seeing, like even these little colors at the bottom of the mixer, just to kind of make it easier to see what track yeah, you're looking at. That is nice. They're small things, but you could easily miss them, not notice that they're there. Yep. I actually aesthetically like the, the look of it. It feels a little more modern. Yeah, there's less nonsense. Um, not nonsense, but like the scroll bars. And there's a preference for that. They just like, they don't have dedicated space in the interface. Mm. Yeah. They used, to, they used to be like a little sliver of your, if you had That's lots true. of clips in your session view. That's true. Now yeah, it's man. just kind of worked into it and then it goes away. Yeah, they updated some of the stuff in the preferences too. 
like the contrast, like there's more of a contrast so you can dial it in. I think that might help somebody who's like colorblind like me, honestly. Mm. You can see things a little more vividly. Yeah. Sweet, man. Well, I have to go, but this has been awesome. Like, I, I it's always become a having... tradition, huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Where we it celebrate is, the new release. <laughs> it will be until 13. No, you should come <laughs> visit Denver. Come hang out in person. Let's do like an in person podcast for the next yeah, big I'd, live. I'd update. love to come out there. That'd be fun. It's like I'm right up by the mountains. So mm, I feel super nice. lucky. It's like a 10 to 15 minute drive to be up there and see some awesome views. Yeah. So come over. Uh, that's great. That sounds awesome. My dog Roscoe loves it too. You can come hang with him as well. Oh, cool. You want to see him? Is he, is he in your Roscoe, studio come now? Here. Come here, buddy. Come here, fuzzy bear. Say hi to Brian. Yes. Oh, I think he was a lot smaller when I saw. Oh, he's gotten the fatter for sure. No, he's uh, he, he was a underfed. Uh, he's about a year and a half, almost two. So he's got puppy energy, but he's like my ghost producer. <laughs> he makes most of my yeah. songs now. Right. Yeah, he's a sweetheart. <laughs> I have much better lucky. hearing than we do. <laughs> yeah, he does. He's like, yeah, Dan, that's a little resonant in around 3K. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's he's the best, man. I saved him from the shelter. and. Uh, cool, man. It's amazing how far he's come. Yeah, you save them and they save you. Oh, right exactly, back. dude. That's exactly what happened. Well, uh, dude, it's always good seeing your face. Thanks again for hanging out on the podcast. Where Where's the best place to send people if they want to connect with you these days? Um, brianfunk.com. Easy enough. That's it. It's all connected. Awesome. Yeah. I'll drop a link in the show notes. As always, go check out Brian's stuff. You've got, do you have like any video courses? I know you've been selling a lot of packs. You've been making a lot of downloads and you've got YouTube stuff, but are you selling a lot of courses? I got a couple. I've got a live performance one that I did a while back. Um, there's, there's a couple on there. I did the groove pool one. Um, I did uh, a push to one. Uh, this this bunch. I haven't done a new one in a while. We might have to add that performance pack to your live performance one. I'm gonna have to yeah, redo a lot of a videos. Yeah, that's a whole other level. Yeah, dude. <laughs> so my so many videos to re-record. It's the life we signed up for, right? Yeah, that's it. Just make a new one. Yeah. Cool. Dan. Any other new projects or anything you want to share before we jump off? I did an album over the summer called Rectangles under Brian Funk. Uh, got my book, which is actually right here. There it is. Yeah, we talked about yeah. it on the last episode, actually. We yeah, were thank you for it was great. doing that and letting me talk about that. Um, yeah, it's a good book, man. Like, I really liked a lot of the tips and stuff you shared. I think it's really valuable Thanks. just to spark creative okay. energy in the studio. Oh, that's great to hear. Yeah. Yeah. I flip to it all the time. I just have an idea. If I don't have an idea, I flip to it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Sweet, dude. Well, everybody go check out brianfunk.com. Give him a follow. Give him some love. Uh, you're a great guy. I love your podcast as well, so don't sleep on the, the music production podcast. Yeah, you got some great guests too. I've been stealing a lot of your guests over the years. So I was like, oh, I should have them on. <laughs> yeah, they get a little cross-pollination back and yeah. forth. Exactly. Yeah. Sweet. Well, thanks everybody for listening. Give Brian a follow and yeah, stay tuned for Live 12. Did they, they didn't announce when it's actually releasing, did they? Uh, th no, nah, I think just sometime 2024 beginning. Usually it's a February thing. Yeah, so, that seems to be what it is. Yeah, I'm guessing February. I think it just depends yeah. on the beta too, because if they have more right. stuff to work out. But yeah, we'll it's see. been running pretty smooth. Um, I have found ways to break it. Um, Me too. But it's only been like a couple times that I've had yeah. any sort of crash or problems. Found like a funny thing here and there, but uh, it's been great. Yeah, I agree. I, and for overall, it's been awesome um, stability wise. It's been a couple bugs, but that's just your classic beta. I mean, that's software in general, it always yeah. happens. Cool, man. Well, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks again. Always good seeing your face. Send me a, a text too, with man. your address. So I'll, I'll okay. send you some magic minds. You're going to love yeah, it. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. And if you don't, just throw it away. It's fine. <laughs> All right. All right. See you later. All right, Dan. Good to see you, man. You too, man. Peace. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening to the podcast. 
do me a huge favor if you would and hit that follow or subscribe button wherever you're listening to the podcast. If you don't hate the podcast, please leave a five-star review. It would help me out a ton. Don't forget to check back on Tuesdays for new episodes. I plan on cranking out a lot more in the upcoming future. Also, if you didn't know, on Spotify, if you click on an episode on mobile, you can interact there and you can tell me what you think about this episode and other episodes and would be great to hear from you and see what you're thinking about the podcast. If you want to be the first to get new episodes and stay updated and get free new devices and sample packs and other stuff that I'll be sending out in the future, join the newsletter. Just go to liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter and or check out the links in the show notes. Make sure to give this guest a follow on the socials. Give them some love for spending their time. And once again, thanks for listening to the podcast. I will see you next time. Later.